Okay, so this is uh, lecture six, and uh, like I said, we're going to jump into the uh, jump into digital communications from this lecture onwards. And uh, you might want to turn one of these fans off, the other one. I actually had had that turned off, but if you can hear me, it's okay. But if not, you might want to turn that fan off. Okay, so uh, so so the general title for the next few lectures can be called. Uh, modulation and uh, uh, I'll say optimum receiver principles okay right so as you can imagine this is the very basics and you should make sure you spend a lot of time with this and let it sink in and you can understand what's going on okay so we'll first begin by looking at modulation closely and try to understand it and describe it in a compact, succinct form, and uh, and and see see what it tells about receiver principles and how you go about designing a receiver, etc. Okay. So the main tool in understanding modulation. Okay, what's modulation now? It's what the transmitter is doing, right? It's taking a sequence of bits and converting it into a signal x of t. That's modulation. That's so. That's what I define as modulation. To understand that. The an important tool is to describe those signals as vectors. Okay, so you move from this continuous time x of t type description to a vector description. Okay, this is not sampling; it's different from sampling. Okay, so don't think it's the same as sampling. Not by sampling, which is used for signal processing. So, right, right. We don't care about sampling. Say, I don't even know what x of t is. I want to be able to design x of t. So I have to come up with a very smart description. And for that, we use some basic linear algebra and vector spaces, and to, to, to describe the whole thing as vectors. Once you describe it as a vector, you'll see you get a much better handle on how to go about designing these signals, what it actually means, and how the receiver will react to the signal in this vector description. Okay, so so that's the main uh, main overview for the first uh, few minutes of this lecture, at least. So how do you go from this waveform channel? Okay, so right now we have a waveform channel, which is y equals x of t plus n of t. So you see, I've slowly moved to a capital notation. Why did I go to the capital letter notation? Right, because each of these things are random processes now. So initially, I've been talking of it as y of t is x of t plus n of t. In our notation, each of these things are random processes. So to be consistent, I'm going to say capital letters. Okay, so each of these guys is a random process now, right? So that's my uh, notation, right? So this is a what I would call a waveform channel. Okay, so while it's a good, powerful channel model, it's not clear how the receiver should react to a waveform. Okay, so on the other hand, vectors you will see are much easier. Okay, so the first few minutes of this lecture, at least maybe a predominant part of this lecture, we will spend in converting this waveform channel with no loss. Okay, so remember, no loss is very important. With no loss of information, right? X of t is carrying some information about the bits b. Okay, without losing any of that information about b. Can we convert this waveform channel into a vector channel, which, should, which I would write as y equals x plus n? Okay, so this is a vector channel. Okay, so this vector channel is mathematically much more easier to deal with, and even in practice, it's much more easier to deal with, right? So you're much more comfortable s saving a vector in a computer as opposed to a waveform right so if you want to process a vector it's much easier okay so in design it's much easier in thinking about the signal it's much easier in implementation also it's much easier so this is a very very powerful simplification which is once again at the heart of digital communication okay so you you want no loss in the process right so no loss in the sense no loss of information about the bits that are being carried in x of t all right so this is what we'll do for most of this class. Okay. So let me go back and describe this modulation once again. Okay. So what did we have as modulation? Okay. So you have. So this is the box we had for the transmitter, right? So the transmitter is going to take. Okay. It's just one big box. It takes a sequence of bits. Okay. So I'll, to be specific, I'll say it takes an n bits. Okay. So if you have n bits. Okay. For now, we'll say all of them are data. Okay. So you have n data bits. Okay, so if you have n data bits, how many different possibilities are there? 2 power n possibilities, and we'll also assume that each of these possibilities are equally likely. Okay, 
So later on we'll see maybe there's need to change those assumptions. But for now we'll say these n bits are equally likely. Okay. So what would be the a probability distribution on the b? If you think of this b as a random vector, probability that b equals a given n bit vector equals 1 by 2 power m. Okay. So that's the probability description for b. Okay. So the transmitter is going to put out x of t. Now I have to describe what this x of t is. Okay, so I'll once again do what I will call a sample function type description. I'll say x of t equals. Okay, so I should be there's no bracket here. So sorry about that. X of t equals x i of t. Okay, so I'll use i here. I could as well use b, but I'll say i and i ranges from 1 to n with probability 1 by 2 power n. Okay, so what am I doing here? I'm saying for each bit sequence that is coming into my transmitter, my transmitter puts out a signal. Okay, and I'm saying that signal is going to be different for each of those bit sequences. If you want, if you want some hope of being able to recover that bit sequence, it better be different. And I'm calling them x1 of t, x2 of t, so on till x2 power n of t. Each signal corresponds to a specific n bit sequence. Okay, so I'm a, instead of i, I could as well use b, which is the vector itself, but just for simplification, I'll say i. Okay simple seems to be uh, seems to be okay all right so this is the most general description possible it's not clear how you go from here to a vector type description I'll, I'll talk about it later but before that let's fix something about data rate okay so so there's some information missing about data rate here okay so for that i'll have to say support of this x i of t what support the values of t for which x i of t is not zero okay I'll say the support is contained in 0t. Okay. Right. So what am I saying now? Yeah. So you take a total time t seconds to transmit these n bits. So what will be your bit rate? N by t. Right. So n by t bits per second. Right. So this is this is kind of what I mean by that. Okay. By saying so if you take all the supports together, you should be totally including 0t. Okay, so bit rate becomes n by t. Okay, so it's it's just I've not done anything here, right? There's no real analysis yet. I've just called, given names to the various quantities involved and made things concrete. Okay, so we'll have to start doing analysis only now. But for now, it's at least this much is clear and it's not too not too bad. Okay, so typically you'll see as you go along into your future careers. You'll see notation is half the battle in most cases. Okay, so you have to come up with notation, describe everything in notation. After that, several times the analysis will be very obvious. Okay, so that's that's, that's half the battle. Okay, so looks like we won half the battle. We have to do the remaining half now. Okay, so for that we'll use very simple tools from linear algebra. Okay, so I have two power n signals, right? Right now I have two power n signals x i of t. Okay. So I'll try to write these signals as linear combinations of a certain basis set of signals. Okay. Right. So I'll choose a basis set of signals. Okay. I don't know how many elements the basis will have. I don't know it. Okay. Maybe it'll have a large number of elements, but I don't care. Once I choose a basis, I can write my signals as a linear combination of those basis elements and the scalars being complex numbers. Once I do that, every signal is represented by the vector of complex numbers are used in the linear combination with the basis. Okay, seems very trivial and basic, right? There's nothing more to it. So that's what we'll do now. So how do I go from a set of signals x i of t to a basis? I've given you x i of t, x1 of t to x2 power n of t. How do you go to a basis from here? There is a standard procedure that people use, the gram smith orthonormalization process. If you're given a set of vectors which you don't know if they're orthonormal or not, if they don't know they're orthogonal or not. How do you find a set of basis vectors that span them? That that will include whose span will include these vectors? You do Gram-Smith orthonormalization process. So that's what you do. Okay, so that's the first step we'll do. Okay, so we'll do Gram-Smith on Gram-Smith is two m's or one m. I think I'm going to use one m, but maybe that's two m's here. You do Gram-Smith on orthonormalization on these x i of t to get Okay, you don't know how many basis vectors you'll get. So I'll say I get m basis vectors to get m orthonormal basis vectors, but I know they'll be orthonormal. Okay, what will be my inner product? Okay, I've already defined an inner product for functions, right? 
that's that L2 in a product. So I'll say all of my XI of T are in L2. Like I said, I mean, I, I, mean, I didn't say that very explicitly, but XI of T will be in L2. They're all finite energy signals, okay? I'm not going to assume I have infinite energy, okay? Since they are all in L2, I'll use the L2 in a product in my Gram-Schmidt, okay? So to get M orthonormal basis, I'll call those basis vectors phi1 of T, so on till phi M of T, right? Remember, my inner product I'm using is what? That integral from minus infinity to infinity, xi of t, xj of t, dt. That's my inner product. Okay? So same thing will hold here. Since it's orthonormal, what do I know about the phi i's? Inner product of phi i of t and phi j of t will be what? Phi 0 if i not equal to 0. A compact notation for this, this is Kronecker delta, delta i j. Okay? Delta i j is a function which is 0 if i is not equal to j and it's 1 if i equals j. Okay, and then what else do I know? What about the norm of each phi i? It's 1. Okay, that also I know by, by just by design. And I know I can do it whenever I have an inner product and a set of basis vectors. Okay, so one more thing I can say about the phi i of t is their support. Okay, their support, it's enough if it's contained in 0 t. Okay, usually you'll never get anything outside of 0 t if you do Gram-Smith. Okay, you start with support fully contained in 0 t, you do, you do Gram-Smith. Because Gram-Smith is still a linear combination, right? Each of these phi i's ultimately will be linear combinations of the xi's. Okay, so you'll never get anything outside of 0t. So you know, still the support is going to be 0t. Okay, so this is a very simple process by which I've gone from a given set of two power n signals to m basis vectors. So now what do I have? I have a very simple way of vectorizing my signals. Instead of trying to define my x of t in each and every time instance t. I'll assume that this basis is known to both the transmitter and the receiver. Okay, so you convey the basis using some other means ahead of time. Okay, maybe you write a letter and post it, right? So do something like that. You convey the basis by some other means. And then what do what is the only thing I have to specify to specify my x of t, x i of t, the coefficients of the basis vector. So that's a very simple trick you use to convert a continuous time signal, which is possibly infinite dimensional, into a simple vector. Okay, finite dimensional vector, right? So that's what we do here. So once you have that, so I'm not going to write down Gram Schmidt. Okay, so maybe I should write down Gram Schmidt. I'll write the first few steps because a typical quiz question is to give you a set of signals and ask you to do Gram Schmidt and come up with the orthogonal basis. Okay, so you should know how to do it. It's very simple. So I'll, I'm not going to do it formally or properly. I'll just quickly write down the first few steps and I'll say and so on. Okay, I'm assuming you've seen Gram Schmidt before. Okay, it's a very simple procedure. So you should know what this is. Okay, so this is Gram Schmidt. Okay, phi one of t I will set to be x one of t divided by norm x one of t. Okay, so you basically normalize x one of t. Okay, so phi one of t is okay. So what will I do for phi two of t? I'll do it in two steps. I'll first define a phi two tilde of t, which finds that part of x of t which is orthogonal to phi one of t. How do you find that? You take x of x2 of t, I'm sorry, x2 of t, and then you subtract the part of phi1 of x uh, x2 of t which lies along phi1 of t. How do you do that? You take an inner product with phi1 of t and multiply with phi1 of t. So you know phi2 of t, phi2 tilde of t now is going to be orthogonal to phi1 of t. The only thing you don't know is whether it is unit norm or not. So then you take go ahead and normalize it. So you define phi2 of t as what phi 2 tilde divided by norm of phi 2 tilde of t okay so remember this inner product is the integral from minus infinity to infinity x2 of t phi 1 of t dt okay so that's what it is but but what will it be the inner product will actually be a complex number right it won't be anything else okay nothing more to be worried about all right so then what will i do for phi 3 tilde i have to find that part of x3 of t which is orthogonal to both, the, no, to the entire linear space spanned by phi1 of t and phi2 of t. So I do the same thing. So I'll take x3 of t minus what? x3 of t dot product with phi1 of t, phi1 of t. Okay. So I find that part of x3 of t which is contained in the linear space spanned by phi1 of t and phi2 of t, then subtract it from phi x3 of t. Right? And then what will I do? I will normalize phi 3 tilde to get phi 3 of t.
okay so that's what you do right so now i'm going to say and so on okay so you keep proceeding like this to get your entire uh, basis how can how can sometimes what will happen is x3 of t will lie in the linear space spanned by phi1 of t and phi2 of t in which case what will happen phi3 tilde will become zero okay so then you don't get anything new you have to jump to phi4 of t okay so in general m can be less than or equal to 2 power n okay so that's what you will get finally right so this is gram smith it's very simple so so like i said a, a, a tutorial problem is typically to give you a set of signals then ask you to do gram smith to come up with a vector representation right so you do it and then represent each signal as a vector with with the correct number of dimensions as you get from gram smith all right so that's the that's the procedure but in practice this is usually done in reverse okay so you never really design signals first sometimes maybe you do but most cases you never design xi first and then do gram smith to find the vector what will you do otherwise you start with the basis and then pick suitable vectors to go to any xi you want okay so that seems like a much better way of going about doing things and starting with the signal but there might be some cases where you have you do not have real control over the xi of t or maybe it's there is additional constraints that are placed on it in that case you might have to pick x of t first and then think of it as a vector this way but typically in practice mostly you pick the basis first and then pick your signals as linear combinations of those basis vectors all right so that's the first bit okay so then what do we do i'll go ahead and write down how we vectorize each of these signals now once you have the basis what can you do you can write each x i of t as okay i'll write it in a long form but this a succinct short form also possible x i of t phi 1 of t plus x i of t phi 2 of t phi 2 of t plus so on till x i of t phi m of t phi m of t okay so so to simplify our uh, notation a little bit further by x i j i'll denote x i of t dot product with phi j of t for each i and j okay so this is short short uh, short and notation for these dot products okay so i'll do that once i do that what will happen to x i of t it simply be summation from j equals 1 to m x i j phi j t okay so this is true for i between 1 and 2 power n okay so remember x i j is a complex number okay so it's the result of a dot product so it's a complex number okay so already uh, i'm thinking of complex valued processes for instance right so so there are two real processes here which i think to i order them and think of that as a complex process all right so so this phi j of t assuming the basis is available to both the transmitter and the receiver the only information is carried by the coefficients okay so i'll say my signal itself xi xi of t my signal xi of t is well represented by the vector xi which is xi1 xi2 so on till xi Okay, which belongs to what? The m-dimensional. Okay, I put a cm there. Okay, so it's not complex. So for some reason you're not able to see it. So maybe I'll write it down below. It belongs to the m-dimensional complex vector space. Okay, so maybe I should put a transpose here just to be consistent with. so i think of all vectors as column vectors i'll put a transpose there just for consistency okay so that's it we are we're done pretty much okay so as far as the modulation is concerned we have vectorized it okay so we've said my modulation is completely described in a vector form as long as i can do i, I can assume the basis is available and for any signals it's possible so it's not a big deal there's no no problem there okay so i want to reiterate once again so we've gone from a random process x of t a continuous time random process x of t to what a random vector x okay so this is a random continuous time random process this is a random vector okay 
what is the PDF for this random vector? How many values does this random vector take? Takes 2 power n values each with equal probability. What are the 2 power n vectors that it can take? Xi. Okay, so that's how I'll define my random vector x. Okay, so my random vector x is defined so that probability of x equals xi equals 1 by 2 power n for i between 1 and 2 power n. Okay, so that's my, it's very similar to the way I define my random process. Okay, it's the exact same thing that happens. Yes. Typically, yes. How do we decide? Yeah, I'll talk about it as we go along. We'll do a whole bunch of examples. So you see, so typically you start with the smallest possible dimension, right? So one seems like a good dimension to pick. So, so a lot of a uh, lot of cases people choose one, two. Okay, there are very few cases where it goes larger. Two is the most common dimension. In this okay. So. So, 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 anything else I should add? Yeah. So, other, another thing I should do is to now say, right, so this random vector is composed of how many components? M components, right, each of which is a, each of this is what? A random variable, okay. So, how will you find the PDF of each of these random variables? How will you find the PDF of each of these random variables? Sorry? From the join PDF, right? So, you, you know the PDF for the entire random vector, okay? So, from there you find, you marginalize and find your PDF for the random variable, okay? So, the way I wrote it down, will, will this xi be a discrete random variable or a continuous random variable? Discrete, right? It will take a discrete set of values. At most, it can be 2 power n, and you will see typically in the way we choose it, it will take very few values. Each of these things will take very few values. Okay, together the random vector, the random vector in itself is discrete. It only takes 2 power n values. Okay, so the random variable will also take 2 power n values. But it's tough to write down the PDF, right? So I can, I can maybe give some notation and write it down. But from the random vectors, you can, it's very easy to figure out how many of them, how many values this can take. Okay. Right, so that's uh, that's the modulation. Okay, any questions on how I went about doing it? Okay, so I can write. In fact, to go back from x to the random process, I can write x of t as what? Summation j equals one to m x j v j of t. Okay, so that's that's the way I define my random process in terms of my discrete random variables x j. Okay, so I've gone back and forth from both. Okay, this is a sample function definition, very classic definition. All right, any questions, things that are concerning you, things that are not clear? Okay, so this is this is doable for the general case. Okay, so so at this point I could do a whole bunch of examples, but I'm going to postpone the example until later, till we have completely vectorized the whole thing. Okay, so we only vectorized x of t, right? You have y of t equals x of t plus n of t. Okay, you have to tackle n of t next. After that, you have to tackle y of t. Okay, so when we tackle y of t, you have to be really, really careful because y of t is what's being used by the receiver. The no loss will really come into the picture when you tackle y of t. Okay, so how, how, what kind of information you keep and all that is very important. So I'm, I'm going to do it a little bit and postpone the example until later. Okay, so I, I think this is simple enough that you don't have to see an example. Okay, so that's my assumption. So we'll see examples. We'll, we'll see ton of ex tons of examples together. So when you see everything together, it will make more sense as opposed to seeing one example after the other. Okay, so we're going to now move towards the noise signal. Okay, so what is my model for the noise signal? Okay, n of t is a white Gaussian process random process 
and uh, I've been assuming what does it mean I'll assume my spectral density is okay not by 2 right that's what my assumption for the noise is okay so there are quite a few n's here the small n capital n n of t okay hopefully it's it's uh, it's clear okay so I could choose other notation but I think n of t for noise makes a lot of sense if we use something else it's only confusing okay all right so 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 what I'll do next is a little bit of a hand waving argument to quickly get to the answer okay so <laughs> so I can it's possible to do these things rigorously by defining expansions of random processes using basis and all that but I'll simply motivate it by sample function arguments and say how you can do it okay so theoretically I can't think of n of t as one function right it's a random process okay so there's no there's no meaning in taking inner product of n of t with phi 1 of t and phi 2 of t and all that but I have to define carefully what that means okay so but even if I think of n of t as a bunch of sample functions maybe this process is not so clear but but it can be made clear okay so it can be made proper and rigorous and I don't want to spend too much time doing that okay so welcome to read the books that I suggested to you Proacus has a very nice section on how to make that formal it's called a certain expansion for the random process okay so it's very rigorous even from a random process point of view okay but I'm going to kind of hand wave loosely and use sample functions and random variables random processes interchangeably and come up with the answer okay so that's what I'm going to do now okay so what I'll do is I'll imagine a particular sample function of n of t okay and try to expand it in the basis that I got for my modulation uh, functions Okay, so suppose you take a sample function for n of t. Okay, so you look at a sample function. Okay, n of t. Okay, I'll try to expand it now using the basis that I had before. But what does it mean? Do we know? Do I know that n of t will lie in that space? I don't know. Okay, so there might be something extra. Okay, so I'll have to account for that also. Okay, so eventually you'll see that something extra doesn't really matter okay, so eventually we'll show that but right now when I write it I will have to include that extra term as well okay so I'm going to write n terms m terms sorry which are n of t phi j of t okay phi j of t okay so this is the part of the sample function of the noise process which lies in the linear space spanned by the basis that I got from a Gram Schmidt run on the modulated signals okay then on top of this I will have an extra n2 of t okay which is orthogonal to that entire space okay so this is a proper way of doing it in general there can be something like that n2 of t is no guarantee that a Gaussian noise process or any noise process should fall within the linear space spanned by your modulated signals there's no reason that should happen okay so this guy which does fall this part which does fall in the space I'll call it n1 of t okay right okay so this is what I've done all right so now if I imagine doing this for each and every sample function right I'll, I'll finally end up with the situation where I can do this for the entire random process itself imagine doing this for the entire random process itself but there's some rigor there that one needs to carefully prove can be done you can see the books so it's doable okay so if I do that if I do this for every sample function you can see this guy will turn out to be a, a random variable right right now for a particular sample function it is one complex number if I change the sample function what will happen I'll get another random number so I'll in, in, uh, ultimately get a random variable I'll call that as and j okay that's my random variable that I get by running sample process to the through this correlation okay it's a correlation right this inner product is a correlation with phi j of t okay so if I run my random process through a correlator I get a I get a sample function I get a random variable okay so how do I get this nj I take my n of t then run it through correlation with what phi j of t okay I will get a random variable okay one needs to carefully study this there are so since phi j of t is unit norm you can show very easily that this nj 
will in fact be a proper random variable in fact it will be a normal random variable okay it will be a gaussian random variable right you can show further that it will be it will have zero mean and variance n not by 2 okay so we'll do this i mean it's not too difficult i'll i'll do once again a simple little proof of something like this i'm sorry is there a question okay so so what am i saying here so once again the noise process can be split into two parts one part which lies in the linear space spanned by the phi j of t and other part which is orthogonal to it so when you do that you have to do a correlation with the basis vectors so the noise process correlated with with the basis uh, function will give you a random variable ng okay so that's my ng okay so once i do that i get this nice picture where this n1 of t will become a random process which i will call okay so the set of all n1 of t defines a random process which i will call n1 capital n1 of t which is summation from 1 to m nj phi j of t okay so once again these things require careful proof but i'm going to say it's possible okay and i'll argue that these things are possible okay so likewise this collection of n2 of t is another random process which i will call capital n2 of t okay so in effect what's possible always is the following okay so you can take the random process n of t and decompose it into a sum of two random processes n1 of t and n2 of t okay where n1 of t is given by this simple summation where each nj is a normal random variable and in fact more is known i'm going to write down that soon enough okay so we'll see that okay so finally what we have is n of t can be split into two forms n1 of t plus n2 of t where both these guys are random processes and this n1 of t is given by a simple expansion of this form okay all right so the only difficulty is some technical language of random process and sample functions so in a product i can strictly do only for random i mean sample functions but anyway we know correlation is like filtering so you can see why all those things should work out finally okay so you can define in a product like things for random process as well all right so 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 let me just make sure i'm doing this somewhere okay I'm doing this somewhere good so so let's look at these nj's more closely okay so we'll try to figure out so what i'm going to try next is to figure out the joint distribution of the nj's okay so the reason why i'm interested in that is if once i do that then i can write n of t i can represent n of t as what a random vector n which is n1 n2 to nm and n2 of t which is another random process which is in some way orthogonal to n1 of t okay so this is the this is the best i can do with the noise process okay i know the noise process does not lie completely in the linear space spanned by the modulated signals so but but what can i do i can break up the n of t into a vector which completely describes that part of the random process which will lie in the linear space and then some continuous time random process which is orthogonal to it okay so eventually what we'll see is when we look at the receiver we'll see n2 of t contains no information about the bits okay that seems to be clear right at least intuitively it seems to be clear all the information about the bits well you should be very careful here n2 of t does not affect any of the information in the bits okay so you might as well throw it out okay so we'll see that okay so it's possible to nicely throw it out okay n the n part which lies in the linear space is the only thing which will affect your bits and it's enough if you decode against that if you receive against that so n2 of t you can reject in your receiver okay so we'll see that so which makes my entire random process n of t at least the relevant part of it a vector okay so you don't have to worry about the continuous time signal so we'll see that eventually but for now we'll just keep both of these things around and figure out how to do it okay so what is uh, once again what's ni okay so before that let me write down the statement the claim here is this n the vector n is iid normal 
with zero mean and variance n not by 2 okay that's the claim it's identically distributed and independent each of these things are normal with mean zero and variance n not by 2 okay so that's the claim so once i show that you see the noise process decomposes itself to a into a very very simple probability distribution okay so not, not discrete definitely it's continuous but still it's an independent gaussian which is as simple as it gets when you deal with noise okay so let's do a proof of this okay so what is my ni to remind you once again it's integral from minus infinity to infinity n of t phi i of t dt okay so this form might look strange to you but this is actually a random variable like i argued okay when this is a random process what you get out is a random variable okay so you can define this integration with the random process inside okay like you do for filtering of random process okay it's possible to do this okay so 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 where am i okay so so the next argument for is for why it should be gaussian okay so once again i'll simply appeal appeal to your filtering notions to say that this will be gaussian okay so when you filter a gaussian process you get a gaussian process at the output so when you do this correlation also this should be gaussian okay so we won't rigorously prove that we'll just assume by an extension of the linear combinations filtering argument that this will also be a uh, gaussian okay so only thing we'll show is that the mean is zero and the covariance or the cross correlation is, is goes to zero and then the variance is n not by 2 those are the only things we'll show okay so it's also easy to see it's not too difficult once you buy the remaining things okay what's expected value of ni okay in the integral when you take the expected value inside okay so once again that's a little bit of less rigorous thing but we'll take it inside once you take it inside phi, phi i of t is deterministic it will come out so only thing you take expectation for is ni of t which n of t which is zero okay so it's a very simple proof you can show very easily that this will work out to zero okay so this will work out to zero because this guy is zero okay so for the covariance a little bit more work is required n a n j is in this case it simply becomes expected value of n a n j right the mean is zero right so it's simply expected value of n a n j which is nothing but expected value of you have to write two integrals and multiply them so one thing to be careful about whenever you write two integrals is what and multiply them what should you do you should use different dummy variables okay because otherwise you will end up doing all kinds of strange stuff it's not correct okay i'll use tau here okay so now i'll write this as a double integral okay i'll, I'll drop the limits it's all minus infinity to infinity and you see the expected value is only n of t n of tau okay phi i of t phi j of t phi j of tau dt d tau okay so now what is this guy zero that's the autocorrelation function of the gaussian white noise process so it will be n naught by 2 delta t minus tau okay so you put in this guy here and argue use your knowledge of delta functions to simplify the first integral you can simplify it as in a very easy form okay so eventually you will get this to be n naught by 2 the kronecker delta okay so it's a very straightforward thing see remember phi j's are also orthonormal right so eventually you will get this result very easily okay so the first thing you simplify you will get n naught by 2 phi i of tau phi j of tau d tau okay dt will go away and that is orthonormal so you get the delta ij okay so it's a very simple proof to show that okay so this shows everything it shows if i is not equal to j the cross correlation the correlation is zero if i is equal to j correlation is n naught by 2 which is what i wanted to prove okay so my noise vector is iid gaussian with mean zero and variance n naught by 2 all right but still i have not gotten rid of the annoying n2 of d to of t part okay so i'm going to make an argument next to get rid of that as far as the receiver is concerned Okay, so let me just make sure I have everything in place. Okay, yeah. 
so 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 where am i where am i so what about n2 of t you can show the following for n2 of t okay so this is the next claim n2 of t and ni are independent for all t you fix a t for all t okay so you fix one t and look at the random process n2 of t and then this ni you can show they are independent how you just simply show the correlation is zero okay so you show expected value of okay so here's the proof i, I won't write it in great detail because it's, it's just a simple repetition of the previous things you show this is zero how will you show it ni is an integral this whole thing is an integral so you write it down you'll get a delta and you'll see because of that orthogonality of phi it will vanish okay n2 n2 is what n of t minus n1 of t okay so you write it carefully you'll get this species okay so this is a important result to know about n2 of t okay so finally we have managed to write my noise process n of t as represented by a vector plus something which is independent for every t okay so that's the important thing. all right so the next thing so so what have we accomplished till now we have finished the transmitted signal which we have successfully vectorized without any problem and then for the noise signal what have we done we have vectorized partly except that there is this independent component sticking around okay which we will get rid of when we look at the received signal okay so let's go to the received signal and make a careful argument to show why this n2 of t is completely irrelevant okay so remember y of t and n2 of t are they independent or not no they are not independent right why how do i write y of t y of t equals x of t plus n of t okay which now i know i can write as summation j equals 1 to m x j phi j of t this is the x of t part for n of t i can write j equals 1 to m n j phi j of t and then plus what n2 of t so clearly y of t and n2 of t are not independent okay so i can't just happily throw it away in the beginning and say just because it's independent with this it's out okay y of t depends on n2 of t it affects my received signal so who knows only thing we will argue is n2 of t does not affect the information part of uh, y of t okay so but let's proceed from here so you see from here i can write join the first two summations and write this as xj plus nj phij of t plus n2 of t okay so the crucial argument is these two guys are independent for every t okay i know nj is independent what about xj okay there's no reason why i'm going to assume the noise depends on the data okay so i'm going to assume noise is independent of the data anyway so any so these two will become independent okay so that's the assumption now i'm going to define yj to be equal to xj plus nj okay and then define a vector y to be equal to y1 y2 okay so this is all let through y i'm going to do these things okay and then i'm going to call y tilde of t as y tilde of t is summation j equals 1 to m yj phi j of t okay so finally what can i write after all these uh, notation you can say y of t is y tilde of t plus n2 of t and y tilde of t is what x of t plus n1 of t okay so okay so and these two guys are independent right okay right so this is the this is the picture finally all right so i have a couple of uh, So, 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 so okay so what do i have for the waveform model finally i have x of t coming in okay i have n1 of t adding first i'll imagine that this is what's happening i'll tell you why this is justified and get y tilde of t 
and then I'll imagine n2 of t is being added to get y of t. Okay, so mathematically this is valid, right? So it's no problem here. This is exactly wrote down what my assumption was and did it. But I'm going to claim. So right now we've been thinking the receiver is here, right? The receiver has access to y of t. I'm going to claim the receiver is actually, in fact, even here, receiver has access to y tilde of t. Why? Yeah. So you simply do correlation with. You take y of t. You correlate it with all my phi j of t. I'll get my y tilde of t. So y tilde of t is definitely something that is accessible to the receiver. So the receiver is actually, in fact, here. Okay. So the receiver can potentially take y of t. How is that possible now? The receiver can take. Why is this true? Okay, the receiver can take y of t. and send it through a bunch of correlators okay so the first correlator is correlation with what phi 1 of t okay i'm not writing the dt okay so just assume the dt is there okay the second one is correlation with phi 2 of t so on till the last one which is correlation with phi m of t okay remember the basis is known to the receiver right So you get what here? Y1 to Ym, which which faithfully represents y tilde. Okay, so y tilde is something which is in the linear space. So it's enough if I get y1 through Ym. I know my y tilde. There's no problem. So y tilde is definitely accessible to the receiver. Okay, but once this processing has been done, n2 has been lost. Okay, n2 is gone. Okay, so n2 is not there anymore. Okay, so have we lost something? is the question okay so it turns out we have not lost anything about x of t okay so we were worried only about x of t so what you can show is given y tilde of t x of t and y of t become independent okay so that's what we showed technically to claim that y tilde of t is enough for me to get all my information about x of t so that's what we'll show and from this picture it's very clear if you once you are given y tilde of t you don't care what x of t was y of t is simply y tilde of t plus n2 of t i know everything right so given y tilde of t x of t and y of t are independent okay so once i have found my y tilde of t in the receiver x of t and y of t are independent i, I don't care about anything else that was possibly there in y of t i have gotten everything about x of t in y tilde of t okay so it makes a lot of intuitive sense also but mathematically to rigorously show it you have to show given y tilde of t x of t and y of t are independent okay so in this picture also it seems to be clear enough okay so given the y tilde of t x of t and y of t will be independent okay of course y of t and x of t are not independent okay in general right y of t is x of t plus n of t is so very much you are hoping that it's not independent you are hoping to get information about it but y tilde has all that dependence in it Okay, once you are given y tilde, x of t and y of t become independent. Okay, so though if you are worried about only x of t, you can throw away everything else that is in y of t and worry only about y tilde. Okay, so so from I'm going to just do proof by picture. Okay, so there's nothing more required. If you want, you can write it down. It's not a big deal. It's simple proof by picture. It works very clearly. All right. So finally, what do I have? Finally, I have a very very simple vector model. without any n2s of t floating around because i know i don't care about it as far as recovering everything is concerned okay so here's my final vector model okay which is very very powerful i'm going to say i have a vector x to which a noise vector n gets added and i get a vector y okay so this is my entire model okay so what happens the transmitter takes in a sequence of bits and puts out a vector x okay so what is x it's an m dimensional vector and what's the pdf of x right i'm going to say it's equally likely maybe i'll change this definitions later for now it's equally likely to be any one of my original design things what about n n is once again n m dimensional 
and it is iid normal with zero mean and variance n0 by 2 this n0 by 2 is the exact same power spectral density for my noise process n of t okay so you might think it's a theoretical quantity but in practice you can measure it at the receiver okay you don't transmit anything you will get some signal right measure its power that will give you my power spectral density for the noise okay so there are machines that will give you there are equipment which will give you that n0 by 2 so it's a very measurable quantity and in your model the same n0 by 2 appears okay and then y is what y1 through ym and how do i define y each yi is xi plus ni okay so this is pretty much a scalar model okay so from not from a vector model we've come down to even a scalar model okay if for instance i know the xi's are independent then the scalar model is good enough i don't even care about the vector model okay so i don't know for sure from the vector pdf if the xi's are independent if the xi's are independent the scalar model is good enough okay but in general i have the vector model with x1 through xm and y1 through y so given the pdf for x and pdf of n can you find the pdf for y you should be able to find okay so you should say confidently that i know how to find it once you find it your entire problem is solved it becomes a very classic detection problem which we will talk about as we go along okay so this process is very important go back and look at this lecture once again very carefully and convince yourself we have not made any assumptions or we have not given up anything we keep we have kept everything that we possibly need and finally we have a very very simple probabilistic vector model with no random process floating around very simple noise process to model my y, y of t equals x of t plus n of t which was a waveform model okay so we'll stop here for now